to you, DMAB Innovation Talk number 10. I'm really excited to have the already the 10th Innovation Talk. I never imagined when we started this about two years ago that we would do a double digit number of talks like that. But to be honest, I'm really happy that we do. And I always like to come back to all of you and to start with the next Innovation Talk. Um, with me at the moment already are Philip from, uh, he is our guest today. I will tell you a little bit more about Philip in, well, probably three or four minutes. And with me as well is the Lindy Van Eck. She is um, the chair of the DMAB, the Direct Marketing Advisory Board of the UPU. And she will give you some introduction to the DMAB in a minute as well. But before we do that, I just see, hello from sunny Tenerife. Uh, I don't want to know how hot it is at Tenerife, at Tenerife at the moment, because I would be terribly not happy because we are we here at the moment have rain at about two degrees Celsius. So wherever you are, rainy Hamburg, yes, Oli, uh, it's the same for me. Uh, we are near Hamburg, so it's quite cold here. 26 degrees. Well, that wasn't nice, Raphael. That wasn't really nice. And Bellini already told me you have about 30, 36 to 38 degrees at the moment. That's well, great. South Africa, probably the same. Argentina, it's quite early in Argentina. What is it at the moment? Nine o'clock in the morning in Argentina? I think so. Then we have China, which is great. I, I don't know. Did we already have China, Bellini? I've never seen somebody from China. I think it's the first time. Pakistan, we already had. That's great. 11 a.m. Okay, so I was two hours wrong. Uh, so it's not too early in Argentina. India, 7.30 p.m. Yeah, it's late there. It's great that you stayed after your normal working times to be possible to take place, uh, to be part of that innovation talk. It's great to have you all over the world from here. Aruba, yes, that's the one I wanted to hear. Aruba is always great. I want to be in Aruba. That's uh, I need somebody who invites me to Aruba to do, to give an in-person presentation there. That would be great. Oh, Jakarta, Indonesia. That's great. That must be very, very late in Jakarta now. It must be something like 10 p.m. or so? 9 p.m. Okay, not that far away. It's great. Turkey and again Germany and China. Ah, it's China. It's 22. It's already 10 p.m even later. It's great that you're all here. And I think uh, it's already two minutes, three minutes after the start, we will start now. So first of all, welcome to everybody to our 10th innovation talk with a hot, hot topic. And we all want to know about that topic. But before I give over to Philip, I would like to Belindi to make a warm welcome by our hosts, the ones who are paying for all this stuff, which is Belindi Van Eck and the DMAB. Belindi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening to you all. Um, I would just like to thank uh, you all for the opportunity on behalf of the Universal Postal Union and its Direct Marketing Advisory Board to welcome you to this 10th innovation online talk, as already mentioned by Martin. Um, I'm Berlindi van Eck. I'm the chair of the UPU Direct Marketing Advisory Board and also the Executive for Corporate Marketing and Communication for Namibia Post Limited, way down in Africa, where it's very hot, like Martin has just said. Um, for any newcomers that are joining us for the first time online today, I would just like to give you a bit of background. Um, we started these on online sessions um, in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, when the UPU Direct Marketing Advisory Board which consists mostly out of postal operators and private sector members, introduced this brilliant online platform to keep us all in touch and to stimulate interest and share knowledge on the topic of direct marketing through postal channels. Of course, the success of such online sessions rests in the hands of a professional moderator, and we are pleased to continue today's conversation once again with the support of Martin Nitschke in the role as moderator. Thank you, Martin. Then looking back at the previous nine innovation talk sessions, um, we have been very pri privileged to be able to learn from very knowledgeable, well-versed guest speakers on a variety of topics, all professionals within the field of direct marketing, focusing on innovation and how it impacts and changes the world around us. Today is certainly no exception. 
and we are very fortunate and privileged to have a professor, Dr. Philip Rauschnabel, professor of digital marketing at the University of Bundeswehr in München, joining us online today and leading us on the theme metaverse from buzzword to disruption. Thank you very much, Professor, for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your thoughts on the topic with us. And from the UPU Direct Marketing Advisory Board, we wish you all a great hour of discovery and conversation and discussions. <coughs> and with that, I hand it back to you, Martin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Belindy. And thanks for you and the advisory board to make all of this possible. And thank you as well to Philip to be our guest today. I, I think it was the first time I met Philip some three months ago in, I, I think it was late September or early October, uh, when we had a science uh, talk uh, festival from the German Direct Marketing Association. And he did a fantastic presentation on the metaverse on that day. And when I heard that presentation, I was really fascinated. And at the end, I thought, OK, that's the guy I really would like to have in our innovation session. And then I asked him, and I was very happy when he said, yes, I'm coming. So Philip, welcome to you. What we are doing now is you have the floor. You have for about uh, well, half an hour or so. But please let us a little bit time at the end so that we can have a lively discussion. To all of you participants, um, you have the chat uh, at the lower right of your screen. If you have questions, please ask them already in the chat if you want. You can ask them later after Philip this, uh, did this presentation as well. But we love to have a dialogue. We are all about dialogue marketing. So let's have a dialogue today as well in this innovation uh, talk. Philip, the floor is yours, and um, Alindi and me, we will just uh, diminish now. We will go away. No, we will stay and we'll be hearing to your presentation. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See you later. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, I think you can see my screen, right? Perfect. All yes, right. So. Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. And of course, thank you very much for uh, 50 participants who are actually here today. Um, I saw a couple of familiar names. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, friends and prospect friends, maybe in the future. Um, glad that you are interested in uh, what I'm talking about, which is the metaverse. So what is the metaverse? Well, this is a question I try to answer today. But um, unfortunately, and this is a spoiler now, so if you want to have some excitement, just mute your speakers for a second. Uh, we won't be able to define it because it's more like a bigger disruptional thing. Um, yes, so who am I? Um, as I said, I'm, I'm Philip, I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm an academic, and I try to answer two questions. And one is, um, what do people do with XR? And what, is, what does XR do with people? So these are the two fundamental questions I try to answer. So in my research, I'm not coding, I'm not um, engineering anything. I'm just, I'm looking at the intersection. I look what, what people think, what they do, what they, how they behave in XR, et cetera. So this is what we're doing all day. My focus is augmented reality. Uh, I will explain it later in a little bit more detail, but most of you will know augmented reality from Pokemon Go. And uh, I started with these topics uh, in 2014 um, uh, when I was reading about Google Glass and I thought, well, this is the future. And I was so excited and I was so disappointed when I tried it for the first time. Um, and uh, since that day, I specialized on that. And uh, now I'm teaching at various universities in the world and on XR. And we offered a Bavarian wide um, program for XR, which all students can take, et cetera. And um, I also try to, to collaborate with the industry. So I post a lot of stuff on LinkedIn and hope to share some academic research findings uh, with, the, um, yeah, with people who actually work within that field. Well, let's start with a very general thing. Who are humans? Uh, humans interact in a very three-dimensional manner. So I think this picture is... It's, it's a nice example. You see that child and um, um, she's, she's exploring things. She's probably smelling and touching and uh, looking at the flowers from different perspectives. And this is how we interact with content. Let's call it content. Let's call the flowers content. 
So this is how we interact with the real world. This is what we are used to do all day. The problem is when it comes to devices like our smartphone, this is how we behave. So we look at two dimensional screens in a limited size and we want to be immersed in that. And that is so artificial. It's, it's very surprising that we can do so. That it's, it's very surprising that we get entertained from a device like that because it's two dimensional. It's very small. It's a very small sized screen. And it's even worth. It distracts us from the real world. So this is the big disadvantage of the technologies we're using today. If we want to try that together, tie that together and say, okay, what are the strengths and benefits? We could say, well, we have a digital reality on our smartphones or our tablets, et cetera, and that has some disadvantages. It's unnatural, it's limited in size, and it's only seeing and hearing. Maybe, maybe a little bit of vibration, but that's it. But, they also have some advantages, you know? I mean, uh, a smartphone device is, uh, allows us to reach a lot of people. It's interactive. Um, we, we, can, um, we can share content, yeah? Um, we can reach a lot of people. We can copy things. So it has some advantages. But when we look at the true reality, so just remember the child in the first slide, uh, the true reality is natural, it's unlimited in size, so we can go everywhere, there are no borders, it's multi-sensory, so we can touch, smell, taste, everything, but it also has some drawbacks. It's not digital, so we, have all, so we are missing all the benefits digital content has. We have a very low personal reach, of course, we can shout and some people might hear it, but that's it. We can't do a lot of more. We, we, that, this is a, a strong limitation. And we have a limited shareability, so we can't take a flower and just share it with everyone because we can't copy it. So what's the idea of the metaverse? The idea of the metaverse is just take the pros of both and put it together. That is the idea of a metaverse. But a metaverse is more than XR. This is very important. So when we look at XR, um, here is just, uh, I don't want to go too much into depth. Um, so this is an academic work we conducted just to organize these terms. It's based on, um, on expert interviews. So we say XR means X reality, which is all kinds of new reality formats like augmented reality, virtual reality, diminished reality, mixed reality, um, whatever you, you find. Um, we don't call it extended reality because extended reality is in conflict with virtual reality because in virtual reality you're close to from reality so you're not extending the reality you're replacing the reality um, and although a lot of people use ar and vr in the same sentence uh, um, they represent fundamentally different concepts so the idea of ar is you bring virtual content in your physical environment and in vr the main principle is called telepresence, which means you bring yourself into another virtual environment. You, so you transport yourself somewhere else. And this is called telepresence. Yeah? And of course, there are very sophisticated forms where people might have difficulties to distinguish real objects from virtual objects, um, which is called mixed reality. Or there's some very simple AR, like textual boxes where people know, well, this is not real. Uh, and this is what we call assisted reality. And of course, there are a lot of things in between. And we can have a similar distinction for VR, where we have some very simple forms, like 360 degree content, and to highly immersive um, multi central VR content. So this is just like a short understanding of the topics um, we are talking about, because I will be talking about AR and VR um, over the next probably 25 minutes and discuss it in the context of the metaverse. So let's have a look at AR and VR first before we try to answer the question what the metaverse is. Here are some very common examples of use cases for augmented reality. For example, um, in the top left corner, there is an example what we would call remote assist. You might have heard of that, but remote assist means that another person like an expert can join your field of view and can tell you what to do in your field of view. So rather than explaining a complex situation, like, okay, take the dark red cable and put it in the seventh plug on the, on the left side, the expert could just like draw and say, okay, this cable needs to be here. Um, 
Right next to that, there is an example of IKEA. It's one of the most used examples in augmented reality because IKEA has used 3D objects of their furniture items and put them in an app so people can place virtual versions of their furniture in their homes. That is, of course, a great example. Eh? Um, the next photo here is uh, the Mars rover, which is also a nice idea because you can explore the size and the speed of a Mars rover in your local physical environment. So you can just place it there and see, okay, how tall is a Mars rover compared to my car, for example, or how fast is it? Yeah. And the example on the right side, yeah, this is something you all have on your phones. This is one of the most useful augmented reality applications that exist nowadays. And this is like a little homework for you, try it. It's a Google Maps um, augmented reality function. So rather than looking at an abstract um, map on your phone and trying to figure out what does this abstract representation of my environment actually mean, you just hold your phone, you look through your phone, and Google Maps will play some arrows in your field of view and tell you where to go. And this is much more, way more accurate than any other form of navigation. So please try it when you walk through an unknown city. It's really one of the best ways. Um, at the bottom, we see two other examples. Um, one is a gaming example of Lego. Um, now I'm speaking as an XR professor and not as a dad. Um, but um, Lego has an app where you can enrich physical products. Yeah, so you can have, for example, multiplayer modes and you can play with virtual creatures that um, augment physical toys. And on the left side and the bottom, it's a learning example. And this was um, a study we conducted um, for a training academy. And they are using the Microsoft HoloLens device and Minecraft uh, to teach um, agile project management. So they use it to teach Scrum. Ah, so they use the HoloLens device to practice and teach Scrum. So, yeah. so where are we in augmented reality? Um, in terms of hardware nowadays, it's mostly smartphones. Yeah. So most AR applications that we see run on smartphones. The problem is the smartphone is the wrong device for a majority of use cases. So smartphone is nice for applications where you can see yourself, for example, some makeup apps, but typically it's the wrong application for something you use on a longer time. And just as a spoiler for later, when we talk about the metaverse, it means you're exposed to that kind of content all day or at least for a longer time period. And therefore, smartphone is the wrong device. However, this is what we have right now. Uh, we have some devices, we have some um, AR glasses that, that have the potential to be worn all day, like this one here, for example. Yeah, this is a, a tooth technology. But these kinds of devices, uh, they, are not, they are not ready. They are not ready for the market so far. So they have issues in tracking technology or display technology, et cetera. But for example, the Microsoft HoloLens device, although quite bulky, um, is a very nice um, device that can show you how a future could look like. So let's talk about VR. Um, I'm more into AR, so you will probably hear me more talking about uh, AR, but VR means being exposed to a different uh, world. So it doesn't really matter where you are because in VR you will be somewhere else. And that could be used for gaming, um, for therapy, for education, for shopping, for meetings, for dating, etc. The hardware nowadays is so far so is, is really okay. I mean, the AR the glasses, they are not ready for the mass markets, but the VR hardware, um, it's totally available for, it's available, it's affordable, it's not too expensive. So for 300, 400 euros, you get a, a reasonable device. However, the acceptance rates are quite low. We currently see kind of a hype because everyone is talking about the metaverse and show some very simple VR apps. Uh, by the way, the same apps have been on the market for 10 or 15 years and nobody has ever called it metaverse, but no, everyone calls it metaverse. And uh, we don't really know how the long-term impact is. So it's very hyped from the industry. So okay, in a few years, we'll all you'll be using uh, VR devices, um, maybe all day or at least for um, a certain time period a day. But we have some challenges to solve. Uh, for example, VR sickness is a big issue. So some people just feel sick, like 20 to 30% with current devices. That number might decrease a little bit, but I doubt that it will ever be zero. No? However, AR and VR can be really, really helpful and powerful. 
And this is one example of a study which we will probably send to a journal today or tomorrow. Um, and that shows one of the benefits that augmented reality can do. It creates closeness. It creates closeness by putting content into your virtual perception of your physical or local physical environment. So this is what we call local presence. And here is one example how um, we, sh we um, assess the impact of this closeness on uh, brands. Uh, so for example, here, um, a consumer is using the Mercedes AR app and the car is placed in that person's living room. And that creates a perceived closeness between the consumer and the brand. And that in terms leads to a stronger bonding between, to a stronger bond, to a stronger attachment between consumers and a brand, which on the long run can have financial benefits. And we have shown the same mechanism also for different contexts. For example, uh, we showed in, in another study that um, people who are informed about environmental issues feel much stronger involved in that topic and show way higher interest to change their behavior when that um, environmental concern or that env environmental problem was displayed in their personal environment or in their close physical environment. And that created kind of like a personal importance and that can really impact people's behavior. And that is, I think, one of the core strengths of augmented reality, in addition to many other things like uh, being interactive and it's entertaining and it's funny, etc. So, but this is one of the main strengths that we can actually also measure. So, when we look at the history, as I as I told you, I started about 2014. When I started in 2014, <clears throat> everyone was talking about immersive tech and immersive, and then immersive tech, immersive media, immersive gaming, etc. And then 2016. Um, uh, Microsoft launched the HoloLens device and everyone suddenly was talking about mixed reality. We say, oh, everything is mixed reality. Uh, people redefined the term mixed reality. So it wasn't what Milcom said in the 1990s. Uh, it just became a new term. And in 2018, people got a little bit sick or bored of the term mixed reality. So everyone said, well, XR or extended reality. And uh, that holds another approximately two, two and a half years. And then uh, Mark Zuckerberg used the M word and then everyone was talking about the metaverse. Uh, and I created this graph. And when you look at, at the Google search trend, it actually looks quite similar. Um, but when I uh, created uh, this graph, I was a little bit frustrated about the number of people who claim themselves being experts. Um, and the question was, uh, is the metaverse XR 2.0? So is it just, better XR? And the clear answer is no, <laughs> actually not. So I try to create a figure that can explain what is the difference or the relationship between XR and the metaverse. And we can try to understand the metaverse as an ecosystem or a development or a vision that includes a fictitious world or an additional world. Um, that is decentralized, so it's not owned by someone. So Meta's Metaverse or Facebook's Metaverse doesn't really make sense to me. It would be something like IBM's internet. Um, it includes some sums of ownership and property, yeah. NFTs, non-fungible tokens, for example. Um, some means to trade, so you need money, and that's typically cryptocurrencies. Um, people are represented as avatars. So they have their own identity and are presented as avatars. There are certain rules and there are many, many more examples that we can use. But as you can see, there's no XR in that graphic. So XR means it provides access to the metaverse. So it's the way how the metaverse is displayed, but it's not the metaverse itself. itself. Yeah? Uh, and this is, this is very important because so a lot of people say, whoa, I have a metaverse app or Gucci has a metaverse app. No, they might have a VR app and they might have an AR app, and then might be a really cool AR app or a really cool VR app, but it's not the metaverse. So XR provides access to the internet and if you want to, uh, to, to the metaverse. So if we want to combine this with, or to compare this with the internet, it would be something like the browser to access the internet. So you would never call a browser the internet, but you would say, well, you need the browser to display the internet. Huh? So, and this is kind of the similarity. 
That means the basic idea is the metaverse is a monitorless 3D internet that resembles reality as closely as possible. What does it mean? It means it's decentralized, so it's hot or not controllable. Like the world, you know, I mean, there are different people who have impact, but uh, you, you can't really control the entire world. Um, you have access via AR and VR. I mean, a lot of people have ideas how VR can look like, but I will show you some ideas how AR can look like. Uh, interoperable, that means um, if you buy some, or let me just use a very simple example. You can, you, you, you buy um, as, um, an asset in, in one specific, on one specific property on the metaverse, and you can use it somewhere else. Yeah, that would be the idea. For example, you purchase um, you purchase um, a special weapon in a game, and you can play another game, and you can use the same weapons over there. Then we have uh, mirror worlds, and I think this is very important because a mirror worlds means they represent the real world as we see it today. Yeah, as and and this real world mirror worlds, they are, I think, um, an integral part of the metaverse. And people can experience these places in AR or VR. Yeah. So they can go, for example, um, to Berlin, to the Brandenburger Tor, yeah, but they could also go there in VR and they could place um, a fictitious item in VR close to the Brandenburger Tor. And the next time they are in Berlin and go there, they will actually perceive um, this virtual asset in AR if they are wearing, um, if they have access to the metaverse via AR while being actually there. And uh, this is kind of abstract. Um, it's a mapping of society. So everything that's possible in the real world should also be somehow possible or imitated in, in the metaverse. For example, some sort of socializing. So you can communicate with other people as, as avatars. You have a sense, sort of presence, an identity. So if, if I am in Berlin, uh, you will probably recognize me or hopefully you will recognize me if we know each other so we can chat. And you should also recognize me when I am online somewhere in the metaverse because I have the same identity or have a linked identity. That's kind of abstract and we don't really know how to realize that in, in specific or in, in a specific use case, but this is how we will um, how we understand the metaverse. Then there's some sort of trading. So for example, I can purchase a specific land or an item or something for my avatar, like a, like a Gucci bag, and I could also sell it again. Huh? So there are some, I can make contracts with other people and I can sell it and I get some sort of financial compensation for that. And therefore I'm losing my Gucci bag. And that also means there need to be defined ownership rules. And this is where NFTs, for example, come into play. However, very important. So this is how I understand the metaverse. So if you ask five people how they define the metaverse and understand it, you will probably get more than five answers because the topic is quite vaguely defined and it's more like a vision. However, there's certain agreement that the metaverse doesn't exist right now. It's more like a vision. And uh, funnily, even meta, um, has changed the way they communicate and focus more on well, the metaverse is something we're working on and it might exist in 10 to 15 years. Uh, just just recently, I was interviewed in a, in a TV documentary um, right after an interview with Meta and Meta, it even Meta said, well, like 10 to 15 years and then we will have something like a metaverse. Uh, I wouldn't say these numbers because they're always wrong. But um, so what I want to say is even Meta is a little bit more careful in how they use the term metaverse nowadays. Let me talk about some challenges. Uh, challenges are not always bad, but uh, they need to be solved. Um, for example, who will dominate the metaverse? And this is quite an interesting discussion because when we ask people who will dominate the metaverse, they say, yeah, meta, of course, because this is their product. No, it's not as we've just learned. And when we try to look at how um, online brands and, and big brands have developed um, over different waves of the internet or digital revolution. Um, we can see there was there were some early brands like Atari and Sega and Nintendo and Commodore. And these brands have not survived the first wave. So in the second wave, when, it, when we all went online from our stationary desktop computers, suddenly new brands appeared like AOL or AltaVista, CompuServe, 
um, AOL Instant Messenger, for example. So these were the new brands that, that really influenced how people used the internet in the 1990s. And then in the 2000s, new brands, when, which we call like social media, Web 2.0, new brands popped up, uh, like Facebook, YouTube, um, MySpace, uh, GeoCities, etc. So ICQ. So these brands came on the market, and they these were not the same brands as before. So it was not Alta Vista or CompuServe or Yahoo who defined social media. These were new brands. <clears throat> and then about 2010, when everything moved into mobile, again new brands came up. It was like WhatsApp and Instagram and TikTok, etc. So mobile internet was not really defined by Facebook or MySpace, but by new brands. And the question is, if we have the next revolution, the next wave of the internet, which could be the metaverse or will probably be the metaverse, why should we really expect that Facebook or Meta will dominate the market and not a new brand? So my proposition is, the metaverse will be dominated by brands that do not exist today. Um, quote me, <laughs> and we'll talk in a few years again. But um, my proposition is the metaverse will be dominated by brands that do not exist today. That will also mean new competitors. So when we think about um, the metaverse, we typically think of games, socializing, whatever. But it could also mean that entire industries can be disrupted. For example, think of these post-its. Huh? Post-its are very practical. I have a couple of post-its here. But uh, they are also very unpractical because think of the first slide. Huh? Low reach, I can copy them. They are not interactive, etc. So they have a couple of disadvantages. But they are practical because I can attach them in the real world. And I can do the same with augmented reality post-its. So I can place augmented reality post-its, as you can see here on that slide on the wall, and I can share it, I can add videos on a post-it. So things that are not possible with physical post-its. So the question is, uh, will content creators be the new competitors to physical products? And our research says, yes, and people are extremely open to that. So we surveyed a couple of thousand consumers in different studies with different research designs in Germany and in the US. And we found surprisingly high acceptance rate for that, um, especially post-its or TV screens, etc. cetera, um, especially TV screens. I mean, TV screens are such an unpractical technology. They are so big, they are so expensive, um, they are huge. And when you're not using them, they look terrible. I mean, it's just a black box on your wall. Uh, and and they, it would be way more practical if you have a five euro or five dollar um, AR app that you can attach to a wall if you want to watch a movie, and if not, you're just closing it again. Yeah. So that could be a big um, thing. Next, data protection. Uh, we complain about our smartphones that they are collecting too much data about us. Uh, that's true, it's dangerous. However, um, we have kind of control. So if we want to protect our privacy, um, then um, we can just turn off our devices. However, with AR, it's kind of different because these technologies are packed with sensor technology. So they are invading the privacy of other people. And that's a big game changer because now we, only have to, we, don't, we don't only have to care about our own privacy, we also have to care about the privacy of other people. And psychologically speaking, um, that's a different topic. Uh, so people uh, react differently when it comes to other people's privacy than when they talk about their own privacy. It also means um, that we can have new ethical challenges. For example, here on the left side, you see an example um, of a study conducted by um, Italian scholars, and they used um, a 3D sensor technology, LiDAR scanners, that are integrated in modern smartphones. And they scanned people's faces, took a photo, and then they trained a neural network and estimated can we predict how a person looks like in, in an RGB photo by just knowing how the person looks like on a 3D scan? And as you can see on these pictures, on the left side, there's the RGB photo, and on the right side, there is the estimated, the estimated photo. And I think, personally, that looks very, very, very similar. So there's a, it's quite a 
a high chance that in the future we can use 3D can scans to estimate how people look like. And that is kind of challenging because it's quite easy to hide LiDAR scanners behind plastic. For example, in a Tesla car, you don't see the LiDAR scanners be because they're behind plastic. So these devices get smaller, so we can hide. Basically, we can, we can take photo through plastic. So this is the practical implication of that. And on the right side, uh, that was um, a, a 10 minute work um, by one of my um, PhD students, uh, Simon, who um, we, we had a meeting with the digital minister in Bavaria and I said, well, can we have a, can we, can we create like a crazy example? So we brainstormed like 25, 30 minutes before she arrived. I said, you know what, can we just change skin color? And he said, oh yeah, that's easy. Give me 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, he created this app um, to change people's skin color. And of course, it doesn't look very realistically here because we just wanted to show it works and we don't have any bad intentions. However, what you could easily imagine is that people with bad intentions can just change people's color so everyone looks like how they want to have their ideal world. And I think ethically speaking, this is a very, very, very challenging development if this happens. Next, I want to show you an example that a lot of people are not aware of. If we can integrate content into the virtual world, we can also erase content. And this is called diminished reality. Here is an example. <clears throat> um, it's, a, it's a use case from um, called Transformer. And uh, what they do is they replace people and cars by um, yeah, futuristic um, objects. However, what we can see here is it's quite easy to eliminate people or even cars from people's perception of the real world. So if we think of our definition of the metaverse, um, we assume that people are exposed to AR content uh, for a substantial period of time over the day. So that means if the wrong people have access to your devices, they could easily hide a coming, an, an upcoming car, for example. So you're not seeing that car. So that is a challenging topic. And here on the right side, we see maybe um, a positive example, which I mean, you're a marketer, so you find it negative, but a lot of people might like it, um, a real world ad blocker. So this is an example, it's a student project uh, from the US and they just uh, trained an AR uh, technology to identify brand logos and just to, to overlay it or to blur it out. Yeah, and about 30 to 40% of the population um, are using ad blockers in their browsers. So real world ad blockers could be the next uh, logical step. Here is also one more um, extreme example of a diminished reality. So this is how a person could perceive the real world. So there is a homeless person sitting um, on the corner. And if you have a, let's call it a not so nice personality, you might say, okay, these people are, they don't fit into my world. So with AR, you could eliminate those people. Uh, and this is really, really um, an, an example that uh, underlines the ethical challenges we have with augmented reality if used in a, in a daily life. Uh, so this is way beyond like catching, catching Pokemon somewhere. However, um, we are living in a bubble and this is very important. Um, here is a, a very uh, simple example. Um, we surveyed uh, roughly 400 consumers this summer and <clears throat> about a different topic. And um, I, I had the idea, let's just add a multiple choice test at the end, how people think about augmented reality. And, and the numbers in bold are the correct answers. Yeah? And as you can see here, um, uh, people have no clue about augmented reality. Yeah? Like in augmented reality, people are in a completely fictional environment. Well, this is wrong because this is VR. However, 36% say yes. So 36%, one third of the response doesn't know the answer, uh, has a wrong understanding. 33% have no idea, say I don't know. And only 31% have the correct answer. And we find very similar patterns um, throughout that survey. So a lot of people have a, think they have a vague idea of what they're talking about, but in fact they have. So I think our homework as an XR discipline is we have to educate the public. So this is our 
main homework. And that's why I love speaking about that topic because I think I have, we have to spread the word and make people familiar with these terms. So where are we now? Um, if this is the development of social media with a lot of different brands that are popping up and that are developing more or less towards social media. So the question is, was ICQ social media? Is MySpace social media or was GeoCities, GeoCities for example, um, is it, um, is this really social media? Then we could say, well, we have a very similar development um, in the metaverse. And we have, of course, some brands that are more or less something like an idea of a metaverse or a, we call it a proto-metaverse. So it shares more or less similarities uh, with a true metaverse, but we are basically somewhere here. So what we see nowadays in terms of, of metaverse platforms is something like ICQ in social media. Yeah. So a, a first, first step. So together, um, everything indicates that we will have a hybrid future in which real and virtual content will merge in some way. It's unclear when this will happen and how it will be, how it will be called and how it will exactly look like. So that's unclear, uh, but something in, something in that way will be happening. But one thing is clear, um, the sooner we tackle the issues, the better. So what we have right now is not the metaverse, but shares some aspects of the metaverse. So what we have right now is the, the ideal time and the ideal tool to, to study and to, uh, to, to, to understand what's going on. And of course, also to shape and define. I also call for caution in the use of the metaverse word because it doesn't, it's not really helpful if we call everything metaverse, if, if it's not the metaverse, you know? I mean, then we just say it's a VR app, it's a social VR app, it's a social AR app, it's a persistent um, uh, spatial AR app, whatever, yeah? A lot of people don't care about the metaverse uh, because they don't know about it. So if, again, if we go outside the bubble, um, a lot of people have never heard the term before. And we should dis discuss it um, across disciplines. And that's very important because developments don't care about disciplines. Um, we as academics or as industry uh, professionals, we care about our discipline. So I'm a marketer and I'm a PR person and I'm an innovation manager and HR person. However, um, the developments typically don't care. Uh, so we have to look at this in a little bit uh, on, on a broader level. So, um, this was my, my part. Um, I know that you have a postal background. So um, we created some use cases and uh, tried to figure out if this is something um, that you are already using. Uh, here is uh, one example that uh, we identified as a use case, um, which could be um, a very simple augmented reality app. Again, not a metaverse app, it's an augmented reality app. And you can scan a product you want to send to someone and it shows you the size of the box you need. Huh? A very simple standard technology included in all mobile devices. And surprisingly, uh, we found an example um, of this concept already uh, in the US. Huh? So uh, the US uh, postal services, they have such an um, augmented reality. I've, I've never seen it before, but good work. The next example could be, uh, and this could go more towards metaverse, uh, um, virtual versions of physical postal offices. So for example, you could have an appointment um, at a postal office in, in VR, so without leaving the house. And you could even chat with the person that's sitting in the postal office. And this person could, for example, see you as an avatar. So this is something that could be possible. I mean, the question is, does it make sense? And what can we do? What can we do better? Uh, and this is, of course, a question um, you guys have to answer. Uh, so what could we do and um, what, what benefits could we have if we have um, virtual agents, for example, uh, rather than um, actual people? So this is something I'm, I'm handing this over. I'm, I'm handing this question over to you. And... Um, I will show my last slide. So 
Thank you very much for your attention, for your interest in that topic. Thank you for, for joining my talk. And of course, I'm happy to discuss these two examples or many other examples um, in the remaining time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philip, for that really, really interesting presentation. Um, it was well, part of it was the second time, but uh, the, the interesting thing I just found is that I heard different things than last time, which is, I think, good thing <laughs> to really get into, into it a little bit deeper. Um, I, I'm sure there will come a lot of questions. Uh, there are coming some, some thanks to you already, so uh, the people love you what you presented, but I'm more interested in the questions at the moment. So please uh, ask your questions to Philip. Now is your chance. Um, until we get the first question, let me let me start with one thing I just were, was thinking of. You said people are not waiting for the metaverse to come. That was one of your last statements. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, okay, in 2000, was it 10 or somewhere around that, nobody was waiting for an iPhone. Everybody was waiting for the next Nokia, which was smaller, lighter, and had uh, 15 days instead of 14 days of battery life. Oh, oh what a dream. And then along, uh, then along came, came Steve Jobs with an iPhone, which was bigger, um, heavier, and had one day of battery life, and everybody wanted to have it. So, so my question is coming from that. Even if people at the moment do not know about the metaverse and do not have knowledge and feeling about it, don't you think that they will love it the, the moment it comes? It depends. So first of all, I totally agree with you. There's a great uh, quote by Henry Ford. If I had asked people what they want, they would have said uh, faster horses. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, so we need, we need this um, initial contact with XR, definitely. And um, we, we are just analyzing the data of a study we conducted a while ago, um, where we had people the first time exposing augmented reality on a, on, a mob, um, on a HoloLens device. And we could measure their initial inspiration over a time lag of over a week. So even mm -hmm. a week later, these people felt kind of inspired. Okay. The technology. So we need to get people exposed to that. Uh, and we need creative people who just prototype and do things. I mean, this is mm. so important that people just like, okay, I'm just trying something. Like, like how did how did Facebook emerge, for example? Uh, not not by saying, okay, so the theory says we need this, not just by trying it and doing it and prototyping it. And and of course, the first ideas, the, the first social networks, they were not very successful. But then suddenly a few great examples came up and those were the ones who changed the way we live. Yeah, totally right. There are a lot of questions coming in. I will just start with the first one. Your views on AR versus VR. So what do you think, which, do which technology will dominate and if you can answer why? Um, it depends on the use case. I mean, there are certain use cases where AR doesn't make sense and there are use cases where VR doesn't make sense. So it really it really depends on the use case. So I would say both play a dominant both play a major role. Um, it's not mm. either or, but I think on a long term exposure, um, my proposition is that uh, people are more willing to use AR over a longer time than VR once we have the technology. So on devices in this size, I mean this is more like assisted reality. It's it's not it's not comparable with a hololens device yeah and and it's attached to the smartphone um but um so people are more willing to use something like that where they still mm. have control over the real world than something where they are totally closed off however for some use cases you have to be in vr because if you want to explore a place that's not existent that's not where you are it's far away etc then then ar doesn't make any sense then you need vr yeah. You mentioned something like sickness caused by VR. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, a, a VR sickness typically, um, of course, if, the, if, if, if what you see doesn't match to what you feel. So if you move your head and the light, there's a little bit of latency. Um, the research says there are three different um, groups of factors that determine 
um, VR sickness. Um, one is the hardware, one is the content, and one is the person itself. Um, we can easily fix hardware and software over the next years. And it's getting way better. The challenge is what happens uh, with the people. Uh, and mm -hmm. our research in, in VR shows that people who feel sick in everyday life, for example, while reading a book in the car or um, whatever, who just feel sick quite often in everyday life, they also feel more sick in VR. Mm -hmm. So we found that in one study and we, we replicated the study and we divided, we used two different devices. So we used a very fancy, one of the newest VR devices. And for half of the respondents, we trimmed everything and imitated being an older device. And we saw, of course, the newer device was better. However, the effect of the person itself was kind was still stronger. So uh, still there. Mm. For, for even stronger than the effect of the device. So on the long run, I think um, we will we will be able to solve issues about content and hardware but we will still have to struggle that some people will feel sick in VR, mm -hmm. at least when used over a longer time. I mean, I don't want to talk too much about it, but there are ways how you can train that. For example, um, pilots get kind of a, get, get, get a training uh, not to feel sick, but they, had, they just have to, they just have to, have to feel sick for two weeks and then they get used to that okay and you can't do that with vr so you can't tell you okay i mean <laughs> you 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 are, you are you're just you can buy your new weeks. vr in the shop and then you have to feel sick for two weeks and then it yes. makes fun i yeah. think that will be a hard sell yeah yeah uh, that will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay there are several questions around the generations so let's start with the older generation do you have the feeling that we are or metaverse will exclude the older generation or because not everyone is so technophile and loves this or do you maybe think the other way around so people older people can visit their grandchildren in some kind of vr or ar environment and will use it maybe even more so what do you think about that so our research replicates common sense uh, younger people like it more this is true for mm. all technologies. And, and this is something that will disappear over time because first of all, younger people are becoming older. And second, once younger people are using it, older people think, okay, I have to use it too. <laughs> so mm. um, the older people are typically not among the early adopters, but they are more towards the late majority, but they are not excluded. Some people, for example, who have problems with um, stereoscopic viewing, um, they might have issues so that VR does or 3D effects don't work as, as expected. Um, but um, I don't think age is a major turnoff. Mm -hmm. And for the younger generation, there's a question that they tend, or it seems that they tend to prefer less physical and more virtual worlds. Do you think that this is something that um, will be a big difference for advertising then as well? So. Will there be advertising in this virtual world to reach this younger generation? Yes, and I was, I'm sure we will make the same mistakes as we did with all um, previous generations because we tried to copy what was effective in the wave before. Yeah, So mm -hmm. uh, mass advertising, for example, was kind of successful in the offline world. Uh, then people went online, so we placed static banners everywhere and said, well, people now have to buy our products. Or when social media started, uh, companies posted like, okay, here is a discount, 10% off. And people were unfollowing their brands and said, well, I'm not interested in that. So mm -hmm. um, companies had to train journalistic skills and marketers had to become like little journalists and create good content, which was called content marketing. And we'll have very similar challenges in AR, for example, uh, in which situations is VR content better than AR and in which physical situations um, is which, um, which virtual content helpful to us. And this is not that easy. So we study a lot how, how people perceive different content in different contexts. And this is so complicated. So it's not as easy that we would say, okay, it, if there's a match, people like it. If there's a dismatch, people don't like it. No, it's quite complicated. Uh, we don't really, un we don't have a full understanding of that yet. And mm -hmm. um, I think marketers will have to learn um, new, new, new you laws, of, yeah, new laws, new rules, and how to place it. And yeah, laws, by the way, also legal issue. For example, mm -hmm. am I allowed to place um, if if I was Coca Cola? Um, am I allowed to place a virtual Coca-Cola banner in your backyard? 
well, I'm hmm. not allowed to place a physical banner there because it's your property, but a virtual banner, which you can only see if you have access to that kind of metaverse. I have no idea. Huh? It's an and interesting question because there might be, well, in, in reality, there might be different laws in different countries. Yes. So will we have different metaverses with different laws might be another question because, yes. well, it doesn't, well, we have only one universe, but it, it seems to be the case that we won't get only one metaverse, but more yeah. like a plural, like metaverses, <laughs> like one from meta, another one from, no idea, Microsoft, and the next one from whomever there might be, the companies you told yeah. us we don't know even the names about yet. Yeah. So will, will there be more than one, one metaverse? What do you think? Or will, will it be one, one big one where all these things are merging? Maybe. It, I, I, it could, could be both. I mean, it's very hard to predict. Uh, the, the question is also, when would you call something a metaverse? <laughs> or, yeah, or when is it just a, what would be, for example, um, a social VR app that everyone is using? Would you call it, mm. yeah, that's a proto-meta type? I mean, it's a definition question, but it, it mm. could be that several platforms exist. Um, there are some questions around the postal services. So do you think that mail or physical mail, how this can work in some way synergistically with a technology like AR, VR? Well, you showed the, the example with the, with the package size. I like that one much. Yeah. But um, beside, or I, more than that, do you think we will have some kind of postal services in the metaverse, or is this all so so virtual that you don't not, you not need really these services? Well, it, it, uh, we discuss these ideas. Um, so one very simple way could be a navigation system for for um, for postal delivery. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it's just like shown in your field of view, and you 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 bring you bring your Amazon delivery, and it just takes a photo how you deliver it, and everything is documented. So that could be a a very simple and pragmatic way. Um, however, there could also be something like a new form of email, for example. I have no idea how that could look like. So this is something I have to get back to you and say, well, think of that idea. Um, how could an email look like in the metaverse? Would it be something that looks like a physical mail? Would it be something that is text? Is this something different? Is it something that you find in a physical post box? Is it something in 3D or in, in 2D? Does it have to be 2D text only like we know an email today? Or is it something totally different? So this is something I have to get back to you. But um, I would say, uh, uh, don't try, it, uh, don't try to, to copy uh, physical letters uh, in the metaverse. It, might be something might be something better i agree with you i think that the postal operators shouldn't try to copy something but on the other side there might be a chance to well to reuse some ideas we have in the mm -hmm. physical world so if i look for one of the best things that a physical letter has which an email doesn't has is the the physical feeling around it. so i can mm -hmm. touch it there might be a a thicker paper or a thinner paper. So there's some haptic experience with that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we will have something like that in the metaverse as well? So is there something like a, like a haptic uh, technology out there? Yeah, the different ways how you can do that. So one is in, in, in VR, that the VR technology identifies objects in your physical environment and overlays content. For example, you can have a ball in your hand, a, foot, um, a soccer ball, and, and it could display like a globe out of it. So that, that something like that could work. Um, and the other idea is that we um, see developments that um, integrate haptics into XR. For example, mm -hmm. um, we know it from a controller, so it could vibrate when we touch something it could vibrate. And then we, there are a couple of developments in terms of haptic gloves. So gloves that have um, sensors included. So once you touch something, um, you get like a haptic feedback. Huh? So this is, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, yeah, I mean, the, the manufacturers, um, they, they promise it's not a prototype anymore. Personally, I think it's still a prototype phase because it's not a, it's not a daily use. It's not something that a lot of people have, but what I want to, to 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 um or my, my the message i want to communicate is there are developments so the community is aware that haptics matter uh, we need it and one last thing on that um we, we have one um academic study where we show that even though people can't touch it people have the feeling that they touch it 
So even when they see, so pe there are certain people who have, it's called high need for touch. So these people have to touch everything before they make a decision. And in, in our one paper, um, we could show that people who have a high need for touch, um, they are more happier with AR um, than mm. those people with a low need for touch. And this is kind of interesting because people with a high need for touch, they typically don't like online shopping that much. Um, but in, in AR, when they see a product that looks touchable, um, they, they can satisfy their need for touch. That's interesting, especially if we get more senses to work together. At the moment, we are speaking more or less about visual sense and audio sense, but it would be interesting how this develops if we have the haptic sense or the smelling or something like that to work together and giving a more, well, well yeah. immersive feeling of the whole thing. Yeah. So we get more and more questions. I have to tell you all people, it's, it's one minute past four. We are more or less already over time and I'm German. I'm not to be allowed to be over time. I have to, have to switch the schedule. So, but I think we can do one or two last questions, Philip. Is that okay for you? Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. if you have further questions, just, just text me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to continue the discussion. Uh, that's good. I, I see that you have about 10,000, around 10,000 followers on LinkedIn already. So maybe after today, there might be some <laughs> more. Uh, so that's great. Um, I see there's, for example, a question around 5G. Do you think that there is a, um, a, a connection between the, this fifth generation or even then maybe sixth generation networks of, of telecoms and, and the... AR, VR, whatever, XR things we are talking about. Is that a direct connection? Do you think so? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, because uh, in the future or nowadays, if you look like a Microsoft HoloLens device, um, I, I showed a picture earlier. Uh, the, the one what I have in my in my in, in my hand on the last slide. <laughs> I'm not sure if you still see it. Um, so that's kind of a big device because everything that the device needs is included in the device, like the battery, the sensor technologies, the computing mm -hmm. unit, etc. And the vision is that um, the devices are getting smaller, and they only include tracking technology and display technology, and everything else is done elsewhere. Um, the rumors say that Apple's um, XR device, which will be coming soon, is just using the iPhone. So that means that the, the, the headset is collecting the data, sending it to the smartphone. Smartphone is doing the calculation and sends the results back, which is displayed. The idea is why should, why should we have it on a smartphone? I mean, then we're just like moving the challenges from the head to the pocket. So why can't we just send it um, to a nearby service station? Yeah. So that's why um, a fast internet connection, if we call it 5G or 6G or whatever, um, it's just essential for that. Otherwise, we still need cables and battery packs and whatever mm -hmm. heavy bulky devices, um, which is not very user friendly on the long run. Uh, the other I, is, of course, I, if we want to scan, if we have 3D scans of the environment, uh, then we need to have access everywhere because we need real time information. We need to know how another person is behaving somewhere so that the avatar can be imitated in a VR world. And therefore, we need information. And that also brings us even beyond the 5G discussion. Namely, it brings us to low orbit, um, low orbit internet, um, because um, on the long run, we need internet everywhere, fast, fast internet everywhere. So the developments with Starlink or the European counterpart, which is currently discussed, um, that will probably be the next, uh, the next stage. Log logical steps, yeah, right. I think this clumsiness of the current devices is still probably one of the biggest challenges I see for for a for a big rollout to 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 everybody because at the moment these devices are still not really fun to wear for a longer time so they are heavy they are they are not good looking so do you think that this will be solved in the next years the the hardware part of it Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the developments we see with Meta, for example, Meta is partnering with Ray-Ban, um, with the Ray-Ban stories. Of course, it's not augmented reality, but what is what is the purpose of that device? I mean, it's first of all, establishing a collaboration between a tech company and a fashion company. Uh, and second, it's making people used to wear technology in their face. So, um, and by the way, Meta is strongly working on AR. They are investing more money in AR than they invest in VR, but everyone associates um, Meta with VR. VR, yeah. 
So of course, okay. the, the, we call it fashionology because it's fashion and technology. Yeah? And um, this is as important as the context and uh, the content itself. Fantastic. Thanks to you, Philip. And I think you said uh, anybody who has questions and if I missed the question, I'm very sorry. I try to get all of them. But if I missed one, I think you can ask that question, Philip, directly. Um, sure. Philip, thanks for your time. It was great to have you on board here. Thanks one finally to the UPU, Berlindi and Frederick and Abby to make all of this possible. It was very nice to have you all here. And now, as it is already the first of Advent, I think we can say we wish you a great time, wish you a nice Christmas and a good way into the new year. And I hope to see you all back to innovation talk number 11. I don't know the topic yet, but I can assure you we will find a very interesting topic again. Thanks, Philip, for being here today. Thank you. And thanks everybody else for being here today as well. And um, yeah, we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.